Samar. So uh, I'm Colin Xia from Nanyang Technological University. So I'll be the moderator for the next section. So our speaker, uh, last speaker will be uh, Professor Jie Liang. So uh, even though Jie was representing mathematical side, so in fact, Jie was a uh, Richard and a low, uh, low, uh, low here professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering and the UIC. He's also a UIC distinguished professor. So Jess works are highly interdisciplinary. So he's actually one of the pioneers that apply topology in the study of biomolecular system and the molecular level. And together with uh, uh, Professor Herbert and Spruner, that he has applied uh, the alpha shape, which is one of the most important uh, you know, topological models in the study of the protein structure, dynamic and function. And this really demonstrates the great potential of the topology in the study of molecular systems and molecular data. I think today, uh, Jay, we are going to talk about the application of persistent homology in the study of the reaction coordinate. Yeah, so Jeff, please go ahead. Uh, thanks so much for the kind introduction. I and mean, it's a really a pleasure for me to be able to speak here. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, my affiliation is neither mathematics department nor uh, chemical engineering or material science, but I heard uh, a lot of common, uh, the, the kind of concept of, we heard about energy barriers and uh, reaction coordinates. I think that this topic hopefully will be uh, interesting to both community. So I'm going to be talking about the non-diffusive topological structures of uh, reaction dynamics of uh, complex molecules. So this is really uh, one of the important problems that uh, we are interested in as uh, the, the activated processes. And these are essentially reactions uh, happening in all sorts of molecular systems, ranging from simple molecules uh, like ring puckerings in small molecules to complicated molecules like protein conformation changes. And then the, all these uh, reactions um, have a time scale, and this, this is characterized by reaction rates. And this is really important because all the uh, organisms in um, the cellular activities, they really depend on proper timings of these activated processes. So the approach we adopt is to analyze the dynamics of these reactions using persistent homology. And this uh, uh, persistent homology has been very fruitful. Um, and uh, one of the important papers uh, is from Henry Adams and uh, Aura uh, Clark on um, en energy landscape analysis. I highly recommend that work. But here uh, we are looking at the specifically this kind of activated processes and the what is the mechanism behind it. And this is the uh, uh, the most famous uh, uh, work on this is the transition state theories. Uh, uh, going all the way back to the 1930s. Um, and so the idea is that essentially you have an energy barrier separating a reactant basin and a product basins. And reactions will occur when molecules cross these kind of barriers. And usually uh, there's a slow time scale characterizing these uh, uh, and, uh, barrier crossing up as uh, because it's you need to accumulate sufficient energies in the relevant uh, degree of freedoms. Uh, so um, until that happens, then you can surpass the transition barrier. Um, so one of the most important things we want to look at is the transition state. And these are the molecules sitting at the top of the energy barriers. And that's where the dynamic bottlenecks of these reactions. And it's an ensemble of uh, configurations of molecules. And one of the important question um, uh, is, is how do we know if you have a molecules in a particular configuration, is it at a transition state or not? And this can be tested rigorously using the method uh, called the committer test. So essentially you suspect a particular configuration or set of configurations to be at the transition state. What you do is that you starting from these particular configurations, you generate uh, trajectories uh, uh, and then taking the uh, distribution of momenta as the equilibrium distribution, for example. And then you look for these trajectories, how often they go to the react uh, product basin before they, they go somewhere else. And you look at the, the ratio of the trajectory that committed to the, the product basin among all the trajectories. And if that ratio is 50% or 0 0.5, then your uh, configuration really is the transition state. This was uh, ideas all the way back to uh, Ansager, but it was popularized by um, Shaknovich and uh, um, uh, Chandler's in the 90s. 
So, uh, but we are interested in these complicated systems. Um, uh, basically, these complex systems have many degrees of freedoms. And what uh, one should do is to decompose this degree of freedoms into what's called, uh, um, you, are, you have already heard about this, the reaction coordinates versus uh, those degrees that are forming the heat bath. And essentially, we're interested in the reaction coordinates because they determine the rate activations and it tells you the mechanism how these reactions happen. And heat baths are, are play the role of providing energies to the reaction coordinates so we can cross the activation barrier to, during these rare events of fluctuations. But it's a very challenging problem to identify uh, where, what are the reaction coordinates because it's uh, it's a dynamic properties and it's not obvious by looking at the structures and you cannot tell from the geometry of the molecules or comparison with some RMSDs or you do some PCA analysis and looking at correlation functions uh, uh, and because all these methods you do and then you subject to the the suspected account configurations to be um, to the commuter test and most times they will fail and and you really needed to have a way to get this uh, reaction coordinates so uh, there are two central questions to this problems and that is what is essentially the structure or the topological structure of uh, molecules at the transition state and this is called the transition state ensemble and then um, what is the reaction dynamics of barrier crossing how do molecules reach to the barrier tops so um the problems we decide to study this problem is to use the smallest complex complex systems uh, as you have heard uh, we have different kinds of molecules or simple molecules and there are com complex molecules how, what do you mean by simple molecules and complex molecules? and it's a uh, by the following criteria. For simple molecules, you have a relatively small number of degree freedoms, and usually solvent is the external heat bath provides the energy. For complex molecules, you have a large number of degree freedoms, and it already has its internal heat bath uh, equipped with the molecule itself, and that provides the energy flows. And we decided to choose the simplest complex molecules that's known, and that's the alanine alanine dipeptide. And the reaction is the isomerization reaction in vacuum. So here you can see um, the uh, isomerization reactions. Basically, is this part molecules isomerized to this other configurations. And this uh, system has 60 dimensions and the reaction coordinates are very well known. And you can generate a, a huge number of uh, trajectories uh, for the systems. So to study the topological structure of transition state ensemble, um, this is a, a very interesting question. On the conventional wisdom is that uh, the transition state is at a settle point, and you look at the free energy surfaces, and, and you can obtain this by generating many trajectories. And uh, you will find a critical settle point, and ha which has a Morse index one. And then from there, um, that's where the transition state ensemble you will find. Um, so this approach is a, a very uh, powerful conceptually because uh, essentially if you can characterize the Morse index of all the critical points and then you have a handle on the homotopy classes of the configurational spaces. Um, so um, because uh, you can uh, look at how these uh, critical points are distributed and how they change the ho underlying homotopy classes. But in practice, there's a huge uh, uh, problems with this approach. And one of the things is that uh, uh, numeric analysis uh, usually are used uh, to find where the critical points. Um, the, these uh, uh, nonlinear methods, new, uh, a lot of them are based on Newton Ralphson methods and other techniques, and they require initial guesses. And many times you ended up finding uh, the same kind of uh, critical points. And the other problem is that you need a, a very highly uh, accurate free energy or probability surface. And, um, and 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 in in real systems, they are constructed approximately from samplings of molecular dynamics and other simulations. And to be able to calculate critical, uh, find the critical points, you need a highly accurate sampling, so you'll get first and second derivatives correct. And this is very difficult. And you have to be able to ensure you can do that at all the places. Um, the other problem is that uh, um, there's uh, you could end it up with numerous trivial critical points if the surface is very rugged, and sampling may add many more artificial critical points. 
So as a result, it's very difficult and, and to know all the critical points. In fact, I think for, for a long time, the, there's no 3D molecules that uh, has been fully characterized about its, all its critical points. So uh, our approach is that we, instead of looking at uh, critical points, Morse index of these uh, uh, um, surface on these surfaces, we look at the dynamic probability surfaces. So we only consider our trajectory reaction to trajectory during the transition period. And then we further separate them along the uh, time axis. So the approach we use is uh, uh, using uh, persistent homology. So basically the idea is that we want to capture uh, the global features um, using homology groups. And these are, in these uh, cases, we're looking at the peaks and their connections. And it's a, a generalized way you can look at global structure of d-dimensional holes. And we want to look at how they change at different level sets. So the underlying machineries we use is uh, uh, using the uh, cubic complexes. We, we use these d-dimensional cubic complexes because it's very convenient for scientific data. They are already sitting in these kind of cubes. So essentially, you can take these primitives of cubes and you can put them together and you can uh, construct what's called K chains. Uh, and then in this case, because the faces uh, of the cubes have orientations, they may cancel each other. So you may get it up, you may get things like uh, the boundaries of the K chains and so on and so forth. So this is essentially the standard uh, language in, in topological analysis. So you will get cycle groups using these cubic chains and you get kernels of the boundary operators and images of the K plus one boundaries and so on and so forth. But the, the, the essential uh, thing we are looking at are these K cycles or uh, on the K plus one dimensional manifold. So essentially this is the case homology groups. We are essentially saying like, for example, uh, the picture here we are seeing, we have these holes. So we're looking for cycles that containing these holes. So we can build these kind of equivalent classes of all the cycles containing the same hole. They are essentially treated the same. Uh, because you can convert one to the other by adding uh, a K boundaries, basically adding these blobs here and these boundaries, they cancel each other. You ended up with this thing and it's gonna be these two cycle and uh, the larger cycle, they contain exactly the same host, they are equivalent. So that's the, the idea we use. And in this case, we sort uh, all these underlying structures of the homology groups in the uh, cubic complex by looking at the level sets of the probability surfaces. So you can construct a descending sequences of probability surfaces, and you can obtain what's called a filtration, basically a subcomplexes. And then you can look at the d-dimensional holes at a different time of the at different places in the filtrations. And you can see when is a topological features of a hole, when was it born at what probability level, and when it disappeared, and at, which we call the death. And between the birth and death levels, and you will get the persistence of this. Um, so uh, the particular software we use is using uh, Hubert Wagner's uh, cubicle methods. And this is my former student, Wei Tian. He spent a, uh, a half a year uh, visiting Herbert Edelspooners and learned a lot from um, uh, uh, Herbert and Hubert on how to use these cubicle um, complexes for computing homology groups. So the uh, I, I will just uh, uh, show a brief uh, um, video to see essentially what's going on. So we can see as we lower the probability surface, we initially see a peak uh, shows up and that's, you can see the, the underlying domains and then the second peak that's uh, appearing. And then eventually this third peak shows up and then some of them gets merged together and that's the death point. So we can plot this. And on the right hand side, you see the persistence homology, uh, persistence, uh, persistent diagrams of the systems. So essentially we did this um, by taking uh, the alanine alanine isomerization problems. We collected uh, um, lots of uh, basically trajectories uh, generated use, using path samplings. And uh, basically these are reactive trajectories. And we take these configurations and we look at uh, the five dimensional spaces. And that includes two of the known reaction coordinates. So you can construct uh, the uh, surfaces. And this is work done by Farida uh, 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 with uh, Hui Yu uh, together. So once you constructed this um, high dimensional, five dimensional probability surfaces, then you can compute the homology groups using the cubic complexes. And what we find is that there are four peaks um, that are um, very prominent. And, and we know their burst times and we know their death times and that's plotted here. 
And it turns out that the first and second peaks are the reactant basin and the product basin. And then third peak is uh, a new peak, and that's uh, very interesting. So it turns out that then we can test where are the transition states located. So if you take um, a location, say, at the, the death point of the second peak, and you uh, take a uh, place bunch of, uh, um, if you place a bunch of conformations, and then in here, in this locations, and you generate lots of trajectories, it turns out all of them go back to the reactive ba basin. If you place a lot of configurations at location of the D3, and then you generate lots of trajectories, they all go to the product basin. But if you take um, the, the peak, the third peak that's showing up here, and you generate a lots of configurations, and from there you uh, uh, make a lot of uh, MD simulations trajectories there, and you indeed pass the commuter test because roughly half the trajectories goes to back to the uh, uh, goes to the product the basin, half of them go to uh, reactive reactant basins. So this is really where the transition state is located, and it was basically uncovered using persistent homology. And then uh, what's interesting is that you can. Think about uh, traditionally from a, a, a protein or peptide uh, uh, point of views. And typically, people think in terms of uh, Ramachandran angles. It's the most important angles are the phi psi. And if you take these two coordinates, you get perfectly uh, well formed double wells. But these are not really relevant for the, the, not sufficiently accurate to describe the reaction dynamics. Because if you take all these peaks here, you, you, run the committer test, all of them go back to the reactant basin. So, you, so these topological features on this particular surface, if you just look at the Ramachandra angles, will not provide the correct uh, transition state ensembles. So what is wrong with this Ramachandra angles? And the reason is because really, you have to look at this high dimensional 5D, 60 spaces and look at where the peaks are. If you do projections to the Ramachandra angles, essentially you, distorted the landscape of the original peak become like a shoulder somewhere else. So you completely miss this. Um, so this is uh, good. So what the next thing we decided to do is to further separate the configurations explicitly uh, by time. Basically, we add another dimension and we that is the, we add time as the D plus one dimensions. But this is a very, very technically very challenging. Because when you run the simulations and you run it at different times and each simulation has a timestamp, but they're not equivalent. Each trajectory basically has its own wall time. So you run it from time zero and until like 2.5 uh, 2 picosecond. And transition sta state, uh, transition uh, basically happens at different places for each tra trajectory. They are not uh, uh, happening all at the same wall time. So what can you do? So what we should do is align all the trajectories so the reaction occurs at time zero. And this is very difficult to do because you cannot really afford to do this committer test to find where the uh, computationally, uh, to find where the transition stage is because you just can't do this. And fortunately for this particular system, we know the reaction coordinates. So we can use this reaction coordinates to find uh, uh, essentially where the transition state. And this is uh, uh, how we did it. So what's interesting is once you add time as the, the additional dimensions and you look at the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the topological structures of these peaks, and it's amazing. And these reactive basin and product basin basically disappeared into very small little peaks. And there's one very big peak that's dominating through the whole uh, space-time configurations. And that's exactly where the transition state is located. So this is a, 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 um, a, a dominant uh, pictures. So what we found is through persistent homology is that there's a strong reactive region in the configuration time spaces. And all the molecules, if you want to go to the product basin, you must pass through this region. And it's domi the dominating topological structures with the largest persistence in space-time at a, this particular very small time interval between five, negative five to plus five femton seconds. And it, contains most of the probability um, mass. And all the things before and after are very diverse in terms of conformations. So, um, so what we learned is that it's very important to, to look at the dynamic uh, surfaces and where you can really characterize the topologic structure instead of looking at the free energy surfaces. Uh, instead of looking at Morse index one settle point, you will find this to be the most prominent pack. 
And uh, uh, the other lesson we learned is that this 2D free energy surfaces, as people uh, typically do with this uh, projected uh, low dimensional spaces, um, you can be misleading. And geometry of these double wells along collective variables are usually misleading. Um, the saddle points in these uh, basically empirically derived collective variables, they are not leading to you to the transition states. And furthermore, if you apply some uh, data analysis techniques such as angle derived angle PCAs, it actually can make things worse. You dramatically distort the dynamics. You get a lot of new peaks that's artificial and you completely um, mess up with the dynamics. So the, the other questions we look at it is the, uh, the reaction dynamics uh, um, at the barrier crossings. And the conventional wisdom is that it's a diffusion controlled process. And this goes all the way back again to transition state theories. Transition state theory it per itself doesn't really tell you anything about the dynamics. It's not a dynamic models. So what people adopt is what's called the, the Kramer's theories. And this is really based on the physical intuitions that uh, we can regard this whole process as a particle in a one dimensional double well potentials. And this is gonna be governed by a Langevin equation. And in the small friction regions, you have collisions and changes, and these will change your energy slowly. And you can basically treat the total energy changes in a, in, as a diffusion process. And in the large friction regions, energy fluctuates dramatically. And then you need to really break down the degree of freedoms into reaction coordinates and really uh, the barrier crossing is then thought to be a diffusion process along the reaction coordinates. But all of this, you will need to know basically reaction coordinates for this. Uh, but the problem is that if we look at the complex systems that transition states, the, the reaction uh, details of this are not known. Uh, the reason is, is, as we discussed earlier, it's very difficult to, to find transition state conformations and it's hard for you to do committer test, and it's difficult to identify this reaction coordinates. So far, our ad hoc assumption is that people just take the face value to say, everything is a diffusion process using Kramer's theories for this. But this, um, this picture uh, is uh, recently, uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Alma at UIC had uh, theoretical breakthroughs, and he has developed uh, theories about uh, um, low dimensional reaction coordinates uh, in proteins, even very complicated systems. Uh, another way to look at this problem uh, in, in the community is to look at the phase space geometries. Basically, we look at the molecular movements in the phase spaces. So we look at the phase space, basically are uh, the positions of atoms and their momenta. And we want to identify the bottleneck sector surfaces and the bottleneck to the energy flows. And we want to find the dividing surf surface and it's called a separatrix. It divides the conformation basins and satisfy the committer test. And then if you can find these dividing surfaces, then you can get reaction rates by simply measuring the fluxes of face points crossing these bottleneck surfaces. And this has been uh, very uh, uh, illuminating and uh, there was a lot of work done in the early nineties. And one of the example is uh, the isomer isomerization of a two ring, uh, the three phosphorine ring puckerings. And it's a 2D systems and um, at very high energy levels, you can uh, calculate the potential energies. You, you can do this dynamics uh, uh, calculations. And it was found that there's a phase spaces, there's a reactive uh, islands. But unfortunately, this is a very artificial energy levels where this kind of a analysis can be done. And there's more recent works in, in the field um, looking at case saddles and potential energies and nowadays with some machine learning methods as well. But this is only only applicable to very low dimensional, uh, low degree of freedom system. It's not possible because for a complicated system, it's hard to find the energy surfaces, hard to get the separatrix, and it's difficult to generate reactive surfaces. So the question of uh, central importance to us is that are the activated process at transition state really a diffusion process? And that's still not known. So what we decide to do is to look at the dynamic flux of this molecular movement. Um, you can do this uh, using the Lagrangian views. You get flux of the trajectories, or you, or, or you can take the Eulerian views and look at the flux inside a volume uh, at a particular time after you have done the time alignment. So we also want to look at the rotational flux. 
So this is how you can uh, look at the rotations. So here's an, a toy example of a velocity field that shows this kind of uh, rotations. And you can calculate it by looking at changes in, in, in these uh, velocities in different components uh, and over the delta x1 and delta x2 and so on and so forth. So this is a way you can calculate this rotation of flux. And you can generalize this to high dimensional spaces by looking at the, the basically one form of these fluxes. And you can look at its differential uh, look at the d-dimensional flux, and you can calculate the counterclockwise rotation projected to arbitrary two uh, plane, two-dimensional planes. So we did this, and this is how uh, we can look at uh, the reaction fluxes in the uh, plane of the two reaction coordinates. And you can see, uh, uh, so the color is the intensity of the fluxes, as you can see. At the beginning, uh, you have uh, some fluxes in the re uh, reactant basins. As we proceed, and you can see there's more fluxes going on. And then that's where the transition, everything lined up nicely and going through this uh, barriers. And then you are now back in the product basin. So this is uh, basically uh, uh, pictures we, we can find in these cases. And you can clearly see how fluxes emerge during the transition period. And it is uh, self-adjusting in terms of the directions and they are concentrated in these reactive regions. And it is the strongest at the transition times and they are uniformly aligned at that time. And it, the probability peaks at that time at the center of the flux lines. And this is really drives the probability peak towards the product basins. And as you can see, it's clearly, it's not a diffusion controlled process. Um, the other thing we can look at is to look at the, the rotation of flux that I just uh, told you about. Uh, let me start by looking at uh, uh, another videos and you can see. And you can see the rotational fluxes uh, on the left figures is projected to the, the plane of the re reaction coordinates. Uh, on the right is projected onto these uh, uh, Ramachandran coordinates. But you can see in the reaction coordinates, there's a strong rotational uh, flux in this. So in fact, we can look at the details of these trajectories. We take uh, these trajectories. You can see a lot of them indeed are rotating three times, four times, five times in the uh, reactive regions. But um, this is, uh, we can broaden this uh, uh, by looking at uh, entrance and re-entrance into this reaction regions. So you can see a lot of this trajectory enter this regions multiple times. And this is, this is uh, highlighted by this green circle, so you can see. And if you plot all the trajectories, that we, not all the trajectories, we take 100,000 samples and look at the distributions, how often they enter the, the uh, transition regions. And the majority of them go through the transition regions three times, four times, five times. So there's a really, really strong non-diffusive rotational dynamics going on during these reactions. And what this telling us, uh, what this is actually telling us is it's that uh, these rotational flux are for barrier crossings. So essentially, you can see in general, there's a movement in the uh, isosurfaces of the committers. And this is what's done by uh, Professor Almas' work uh, where they have calculated the different uh, isosurfaces. And then with this, and you can start to see um, the, the rotation of flux is essentially orthogonal to the isocommitters. And it's really along the direction of barrier crossing, you're going to a different committer values. And basically the rotational flux is, uh, has this rapid movement along isocommitter surfaces, but very slow movement in orthogonal directions. So the outcome is these kind of a spiral-like trajectories. And that's where what the barrier crossing is about. So basically motion in the phi um, angles is assisted by theta one, and it's transferring potential energy from thermal bath uh, of the internal thermal bath to phi directly via kinetic energies. And there's really tight cooperative mov movements between theta one and five. And this is manifested as a this rotational flux. So uh, oh, this yeah, is really- uh, Sorry sorry about that. So I think we are <laughs> a little bit around oh. time. Maybe you have one minute to wrap up. Yeah, okay, so yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. yeah, I'm done. Basically the dynamics basically is, uh, it's very important for us to study reaction rate theories to understand this natural activate process. And with this, we learned that there's a transition state ensemble in a very reactive regions manifest as, as a product probability peak. And the reactive regions has very strong fluxes and they're not in equilibrium. They're not in diffusion controls and there's a strong vertex for this. 
So this is really a first glimpse into this reactive vortex region, the non-diffusive dynamics. I think this is really important for us to analyze reactive dynamics of this naturally activating process and do not take Kramer's theory as granted. And this is really the foundation for us to model uh, the transition dynamics of this. And this work uh, is done by uh, Farid Manushuf Chaffer with uh, help from Wei Tian, Hui Yu, and my colleague Ao Ma. And uh, we thank uh, Professor Herbert Edelsberger and Hubert Wagner for helping us, uh, um, um, teaching us about present homology. And thank you for your uh, attention. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. I think we can give Jay a round of applause. Yeah. So, so any questions? Yeah, so then maybe I can start with one. I think if Aurora is here, he will be, she will be extremely excited. She has been keeping talking about the person how new reaction calling in the past, you know, two weeks. <laughs> so in your systems, you mentioned about the person homology basically for the H0 information, right? So right, how about yeah. H1 and the H2? Is that yeah. really also useful? Very good question. We did look at, uh, because the, the cubic uh, complex method, we can look at the H1 and H2. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there's nothing interesting there. Um, I don't know, maybe our sampling is not enough, but I, I'm not sure. Uh, but the, 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 the findings that there's really nothing we can say about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, Henry? Thanks, uh, Jay, for the great talk. So you, you gave this really nice example where in two dimensions, you've reduced too much and you're missing this, this peak that's important. Well, yeah. So I think instead you analyze that better in five dimensions. So so um, was this a simple, can you say what those five dimensions were again? Was this a simple enough system where it really was only five dimensional or did you have to reduce down? No, I, I still have to, I mean, the original space is 60D. I cannot do that. I it's see. not oh. enough to get to it. But, but I, I, in this case, this is a system, the reaction coordinates is known. So that's, that's, that's why it's possible for us to do this. But basically we pick six dimensions, including the reaction coordinates and Ramachandran uh, angles and so on and so forth. So in that case, we can pick out the correct uh, um, the transition state, yeah. Very nice example. Thanks so much. Yeah. 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 I really, really nice talk. Um, this might be a very naive question, but I'm wondering how this would work when you move to more complex systems, um, such as, you know, larger proteins even, but then mm -hmm. if you wanted to move into a different system, such as mm -hmm. going from liquid to solid, transitions like what Eric um, showed, would the in would these methods be easy to scale, especially given commuter probabilities hard to calculate? And then two, would they be easy to interpret? Yeah, so I think it's a great question. I I think so. Um, I think the key question is uh, uh, first, do you know the reaction coordinates? Is there a way you can do that? And secondly, is that do you have enough? Uh, it's parallel uh, issues. Do you have enough trajectories for populate? Uh, all the, the, the coordinates that you are interested in. You may not know the reaction coordinate, but if you can, your um, subspace contains reaction coordinates, then the Piston homology method will find it if you have enough um, data point to generate this uh, dynamic surfaces, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, 